introduce our final speaker of the evening. For the past four decades, Stuart Hameroff has been at the forefront of research into the nature of consciousness. In the 1990s, he teamed with renowned physicist Sir Roger Penrose to develop orchestrative objective reduction, a theory of consciousness based on microtubule quantum <coughs> computing. In 1998, with a generous grant from the Fetzer Institute, Professor Hameroff co-founded the University of Arizona's Center for Consciousness Studies. He is author of more than 100 scientific articles and books on the subject of consciousness, and you may know him from any of his many appearances on television and in documentary films for the BBC, BBS, Discovery, The History Channel, and elsewhere. He is Emeritus Professor of Anesthesiology at the University of Arizona Medical Center, and we are thrilled that he agreed to be with us here this weekend. Would you please join me in welcoming Professor Stuart Hamrell. Thank you, sir, for the delay. Thank you all for being here. It's a, it's a great crowd and a great group. I've been following the Krishna's Krishna movement for many, many years, thanks to my good friend Kuladri, that I was a fraternity brother in college, believe it or not, many years ago, along with our other friend Jay, and we stayed in touch. And uh, so it's a great honor and a privilege to be here. And uh, he's one of the reasons I got interested in consciousness, actually, and also a philosophy of mind class. When I got to medical school, I was interested in the brain-mind problem and uh, wound up in anesthesia where we take away consciousness. And in fact, <laughs> I've been passing gas for over 45 years. And I'm pretty well paid. Everybody passes gas, but I'm paid for it. So <laughs> I'm also uh, in psychology and director of the Center for Consciousness Studies. So what is consciousness? That's why we're here. We take it for granted that when we open our eyes, the world out there appears inside our head. Bing. And I'm going to use Bing to mean conscious experience, because the brain does a lot of things that are not conscious. We're doing automatic things, subconscious, non-conscious things all the time. So, so and, and we, we sort, sort of know how that works. works. We, we don't, don't have, have a clue, clue really. really. Well, well, I think we do. do. But, but uh, 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 it's, it's really, really a mystery still uh, what, what consciousness, consciousness actually is. is. And it's, it's approached in science to neuroscientists who probe the brain with electrodes, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, and roboticists, uh, artists who try to capture the essence of reality and, and, and the world out there, physicists, the uh, Schrodinger's cat, the nature of reality, quantum physics, psychiatrists, anesthesiologists, <laughs> uh, meditators, uh, Eastern philosophers and Western philosophers. So how does that happen? Well, let's start with Western philosophy and neuroscience, going back to Plato. He would have said something, something like, the world out there is all in our head. Bing. So, so Bing is our head, the world out there is a representation. We don't really know what's out there. Plato realized that was a problem. Plato's cave was a story about how you could trick into thinking two dimensions was all there is. Dave Carter, with his frog, you know, could be bringing the bat, that information by an evil genius. So, so the world as a representation leaves us with a, a mystery of what's really out there. We don't, we don't know. Now, in Eastern philosophy, consciousness pervades a deeper level of reality. Bing. Consciousness is everywhere. We're quite literally awash in the, in the, in the sea of consciousness, according to Eastern philosophy. Can we reconcile these two views? I think we can. Let's go back to the uh, Western modern science type of view. And on the left, you see a bunch of neurons connected by synapses. And an analogy has been made to a computer, which has nodes, switches, and bits as bits of information. So the neuronal fires have been thought to be like uh, bits of information. And this is all based on something called the Hodgkin Huxley integrate and fire neuron. In the 50s, uh, Hodgkin Huxley uh, did some basic studies on on what neurons do, integrate, and fire. And uh, this is uh, one uh, data slide. And basically, this is what is predicted by Hodgkin Huxley, where integration occurs here in the dead right to the soma of the neuron, reaches a threshold, a fairly narrow threshold. And down here, we see the, 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 how, the, how narrow the threshold is. And then there's fire. So integrate and fire. The critical threshold of each neuron 
of inputs, inputs there's, there's a firing. firing. And that, that firing, firing is taken by most neuroscientists to be the bits of information in the brain. brain. And so, so this, this, this is applied to, to real neurons. So here we see a real neuron with dead red and so on. And, and the uh, information, information is transmitted solely along the surface of the membrane by ion channels, channels opening and closing to the next layer, layer of neurons. So, so the integration is in the cell body, the dead and the firing is in the axon. Integrate, fire, integrate, fire, integrate, fire, integrate, fire. And, and you put, put enough, enough of these together, together that supposedly you can get a computer. Now the problem with that is if that is the case, and many people believe that it is, that what we get is algorithmic, deterministic, and machine-like. And uh, basically, it's modeling, saying the brain and assuming it's a machine, and then therefore you get a machine. There's no room for, for consciousness, there's no room for creativity, intuition, insight, free will. And accordingly, consciousness is considered epiphenomenal in modern science and philosophy. And it, like, like Pac-Man. Pac you guys remember Pac-Man Pac a while ago, a long video game, yeah. where he's controlled, controlled by the joystick, joystick everything he's done. So in this, this case, case, our actions would be controlled by our, our, our automatic brain. And we have, the fact that we have an illusion, that we have a, a free will, is thought to be an illusion. That's the party line in modern neuroscience, because that's, that's what uh, following Hodgkin Huxley tells us. And as the result is, as Thomas Huxley said, we are merely, uh, we are conscious automata, merely helpless spectators along for the ride. Free will is a solution. And there's some other reasons to think this is not science, because consciousness, is, the activity that correlates with consciousness is comes too late after we would respond to something. So the idea is we respond non-consciously and have this, this illusion that we're acting consciously. I don't think that's true. And for example, there's actually some evidence of testing the Hodgkin-Huxley uh, idea in real in neurons in awake animals. And what you see there is not a very narrow uh, threshold and a very narrow time window, but a very broad one, and shown here in the data. And there's deviation from this, which means that there's something else going on. There's something other than just the membrane activities that lead to firing. Something non-computable, that Roger, Roger Penrose calls it, regulates fire or spikes. spikes. And uh, what what this, whatever this is, is it's, it's a good candidate for consciousness. consciousness. Because it could be the Bing that's deviate, that, that's, that's mod modulating the fire. fire. So, so that what we, we do is not necessarily always automatic, always algorithmic, and always just totally based on inputs. It gives some wiggle room where consciousness can, hey, I feel like doing that. Or, or I'm get, I've got a feeling I'm going to do that. And it puts us in the possibility of having uh, free will. So um, where would this come from? Where, where would this, this uh, uh, consciousness, consciousness come, come from if the, 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 neur the neural memories are kind of algorithmic and deterministic? Well, the, the obvious place for me is a deeper level. Now, you, you might, might say, say, well, consciousness is some universe and so forth. But to get there, you have to go small. You have to go inside the neuron. And, and into the quantum realm, which I'll get to in a second. So if you think about a, a, a neuron, uh, there's membrane activities here, and then there's an inner world of the neuron called the cytoskeleton, the microtubules. And they're different from dead brains than they are in the axon. But, but it seems to me that where consciousness is coming from is inside the neuron, modulating membrane activity. So that everything isn't strictly algorithmic and determinist. There's there's wiggle room. There's consciousness. Consciousness can come in from inside the neurons and modulate what the neural memory is doing. And that's how sometimes we act differently than we would automatically. We we have a gut feeling. We follow intuition, insight, and so forth. And this is also very much like something that's come along in uh, in, in artificial intelligence called uh, deep learning where there's actually uh, networks uh, which could be inside uh, of other networks that are modulating the activity of a network. Now, another reason to think that the neuron membrane isn't, and synapses and being part of a network isn't the whole deal, is a single cell organism, or many single cell <laughs> organisms. You might have seen recently that an amoeba solved the traveling salesman problem, which is thought to be an extremely difficult problem for computing. But there's also this uh, single cell that I like called paramecium that it swims, swims around, it finds food, it avoids obstacles, it swims in a different direction. Uh, it can you learn, learn it's like a little capillary tube, it escapes faster through time, it, it avoids predators, it, 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 it finds food, it finds a mate, it has sex, and it's just, there's no sense, it's just one cell. 
And here's a uh, kind of x-rated uh, image of two paramecium teeth in a couple. And we don't necessarily know whether they're conscious or not, but it'd be a pretty good uh, reason to uh, promote uh, procreation if sex felt good, which it does. So uh, there could be feelings down at that level. Now, how does the paramecium do it? It doesn't have any inputs. It doesn't have any synapses telling it what to do. It does it by these little hair-like projections on the surface that are called cilia. cilia. And here's, here's a picture of a paramecium with cilia, cilia coming out. And, and if you look at a cross-section of cilia, it's got these weird, weird nine pairs of, of, of structures called, called microtubules. And here's a cilia coming, coming out of the paramecium. paramecium. And if you look at it, it looks like this. this. Actually, this is a triplet. Nine of these making a larger cylinder. And these stick out and, and, and move and, and act as oars and sensors for the paramecium to swim around. And how, does it, how do they bend in an organized fashion? Well, if we do the cross-section of, of the cilia and look at one of these microtubules, we see these motor proteins called dynamite that contract with the ATP. So if this one contracts and this one contracts and this one contracts, it moves in an organized way. Or if it bumps into something, there's going to be a signal conveyed along the microtubule. Now, what does this have to do with, with consciousness? I'm not necessarily saying these, th that's conscious. However, this mechanism, the dynein bending, uh, dynein on the microtubule, are the same structures that organize interiors of brain neurons and other cells. cells. I showed you before a picture of a neuron, and here we see uh, a neuron immunofluorescence micrograph, where yellow is the microtubule structures inside the neuron. Uh, blue is the nucleus, and red are active, and here's the, the membrane. membrane. So, so most, most of the neuroscience just looks at what's happening at the membrane, and I think that's why we're missing consciousness. We need to go to a deeper level. And when we do, when we look at, for example, here's a neuron, and down its dendrite, uh, let's say there's a synapse here or here or somewhere, so material that is needed to regulate the synapse is, is manufactured in the cell, cell body and needs to be transported out to here quickly to give more dopamine, carboxylase, whatever, to fit the synapse. And how that happens is that the dynein, the same dynein of uh, other protein in the parent uh, paramecium cilia, and another one called the medicine, carry stuff along the microtubules. You see the video, it's literally they run along, it's quite amazing actually. But how do they know where to get off? How do they know which synapse needs more enzymes? And that turns out to be coded on the microtubule by tau protein. Tau is a microtubule associated protein. And um, <clears throat> when it falls off and when, when um, uh, that, that causes, causes the microtubules to dissemble, you get clumps of tau. That's called neurofibrillary tangles and you get Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is, is, is famous for the amyloid plaques that are on the outside of the neurons, but what actually causes the, the disease and the loss of memory is, uh, is the uh, loss of tau encoding on microtubules and disintegration of the microtubules. And actually, uh, uh, we, we have, have a strategy, strategy I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later, later about how to treat Alzheimer's by resonating microtubules and, and putting them, them back together. So, how, but how do the tau know exactly where to go on the microtubule? It's kind of like a FedEx code. It's kind of like some postal code that tells the, the motor proteins where to go, where to get off. Is there information processing in the microtubule? And this is something that I got interested in when I first uh, learned about microtubules back in medical school. I was, I was working in a cancer lab, um, I looked, studying mitosis and looking how uh, chromosomes were divided by these structures, which were microtubules. At the same time, it was discovered that neurons were full of microtubules and that their structure was, was discovered. And it turned out to be uh, this uh, cylindrical lattice uh, of, of indiv individual peanut-shaped proteins called tubulin. And I got the idea back in the 70s that the, these things might be acting like computers. And each tubulin could be, let's say, open or closed, a one or a zero. And I, I was reading about the game of life, which is a cellular automata, and we did some modeling of microtubules as, as a cellular automata. Cell should mean the smallest unit, but in this case, we're inside the cell. So we call them microtubule automata. And we showed you can get information processing and patterns moving through the microtubules. So uh, in the uh, 70s and, and then the 80s, I began uh, publishing on the idea of microtubule computing with uh, some colleagues, Rich Watt, and I wrote a, a book about it in 1987, uh, about it, and then Steen Rasmussen, a physicist at Los Alamos, where we did the molecular automata, 
and then uh, some other work. And then in the 90s, I met Roger Penrose, and we started talking about quantum computing in microtubules, and I'll get to that in a second. So if that's the case, if, if microtubules are processing information inside neurons, that, uh, that means there's a huge amount of information processing in each neuron. So the AI people, the people who say, you know, give us another couple billion and we'll have a computer that could be conscious because it's just a matter of more switches, more bits, more computation. Uh, they said their, their goalpost to reach brain equivalents is based on this. Also the singularity, Ray Kurzweil's idea. 10 to the 11th neurons per brain, 1,000 synapses per neuron at about 100, her, uh, 100 hertz gives you 10 to the 16th operations per second per brain. 10 to the 16th. That's a lot. However, if you add the microtubules, uh, information processing inside, you get 10 to the 11th neurons per brain, 10 to the 9th tubulins per neuron, switching at about 10 million times a second. This gives you 10 to the 16th operations per second per neuron, 10 to the 27th operations per second for the whole brain. So 11 orders of magnitude more than what the AI people are telling us will be necessary. So I was going around to AI and neural net meetings in the late 80s being a, a pain in their butt because I was saying, oh no, no, you guys are wrong, you need another 11 orders of magnitude. And, uh, and I was a pest and uh, they didn't like that. But um, one day somebody said to me, he says, well, okay, wise guy, let's say you're right. Uh, let's say uh, uh, the microtubes are doing all this stuff. Uh, how does that explain consciousness? How does that explain feelings, joy, love, pinkness, uh, anything, any experience whatsoever. Uh, and I had to admit, I was stumped, I didn't know. This later became known as the heart problem, it was coined by, by David Chalmers, that had been bandied about by many others earlier. But I, I was struck by it, and I took a long look at myself in the mirror and realized I was a reductionist, and really didn't have a clue what, what was causing consciousness. Fortunately, that same person uh, suggested to me that I read a book by Roger Penrose called The Emperor's New Mind. That, that person, I, I can't remember who he was, but I'm indebted to him, basically saying, where's consciousness, where's the being, is something else required, and is it quantum physics? So he suggested this book, which I read, and was really blown away by it. This came out in 1989, The Emperor's New Mind. And the title is meant to, like, the emperor has no clothes. And Roger Penrose was basically saying, AI, you don't have a clue, you don't have a, a mind in your computer, because because consciousness is not a computation. And everybody has assumed since day one that the brain is a computer and consciousness is an output. Well, if you have an output from a computer, who's looking at it? Somebody has to look at it, right? So who's looking at, at the output? Well, you are, but who are you? Well, you're consciousness. So it, it's kind of a, you, you go in a circle. But Roger uh, did a very uh, elaborate and very detailed philosophical approach using something called, called Gödel's theorem to show that conscious understanding is non-computational, that something outside the computational system is required. A simpler way to put this may be that if you know something, I know that that equation's right, or I know that I love my wife, or I know this or that. Knowing is a feeling, right? You can't prove it by some equation, you, you just know it. And that's even true for mathematical equations. That was, that was Rodney's approach. Anyway, in the book he also said that something is most likely to be involved with quantum state reduction, with collapse of the wave function, and the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. And we'll get to that in a second. And that that factor related to the, that factor relating quant, uh, quantum mechanics and measurement related to the underlying structure of the universe, namely space-time geometry or quantum gravity, and which relate to general relativity. Now, quantum mechanics and general relativity are two uh, cornerstones of modern science, but they don't, they don't interact. They've never actually interacted. Quantum mechanics describes small stuff, general relativity, large stuff, and nobody ever put them together until Roger. And that this would in introduce, and how this happened was a bit hard to understand at that time, and still a, a bit, this would introduce a non-computable influence, something outside the system that you could know something or have some uh, non-algorithmic <laughs> processing. So I read the book, I was blown away by it, I didn't understand a lot of it, but I knew a couple things. This guy was brilliant, he had some really crazy and interesting ideas, and nobody else had ever proposed a mechanism for consciousness. It was the only, the first, and I, I think the only specific mechanism, other than kind of hand-waving emergence and complexity and blah, blah, blah. 
which there's really no actual basis for. But I didn't have a clue about quantum mechanics, and uh, I tried to learn, I got into it. And so I'm gonna give you my simple version of quantum mechanics, because it is very difficult. The world is divided into two realms, it seems. The quantum realm and the classical realm. The classical realm is fairly large, Newton's laws, Maxwell's equations, you throw a ball, gravity pulls it down, et cetera, et cetera. It's predictable, classical, it works. At small scales, however, things get very, very weird. At small scales, we have quantum superposition, which means that um, things can be in multiple states or locations at the same time. Something can be here and here at the same time. There's non-locality, as Brenda mentioned, where you have connection of things o over distance due to entanglement. Quantum particles are separated, you make a measurement here, this one over here feels it immediately and changes, immediately. Einstein didn't like that because it meant um, faster than light, which uh, he had said the speed of light was an absolute. So he called it spooky action at a distance and didn't like it at all and was against it. He lit and, and designed a, a thought experiment, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, which would disprove it. When they eventually did the experiment, it actually proved non-locality. And he admitted he was, he was wrong on that. He was right up just about everything else. But, we, and, and things are wave-like and small in the quantum world. They're connected over distance, they can be multiple states or locations, and they're wave-like. But we don't, see quant, we don't see quantum superpositions, we don't see quantum stuff in our classical world. I see one of you, presumably you see one of me. Uh, things aren't smeared off, like, smeared, off uh, uh, smeared around like a wave, they're in definite places. Now for example, a particle can exist as, as a wave of multiple possibilities. Here's, a, here's an, an atom, I think it's a cesium atom. Here in the yellow it's in one location, but in the background you see it in its waveform, where it's actually in multiple locations at the same time. This is, this is uh, quantum superposition. So it can be a wave or a particle. It can be in multiple locations, but when you, but uh, uh, it can be multiple locations, or, but when you observe it or measure it, it's in one location. The world we consciously perceive is exclusively made of particles in definite states, not waves of super, superposition. And in the early days of quantum mechanics, at the turn of the 20th century, Niels Bohr and all those guys found that experiments seemed to show that superposition persisted only until being measured or consciously observed. It's like the refrigerator light. You close the door, you assume it, you assume it goes off. You don't really know. Okay, so if you're not looking at something, it's a, it's, no, it's a wave, it's in multiple locations. You look at it and it collapses to one of the other. One of the other. So the presumption was that consciousness collapses the wave function to definite states. So you make a measurement or a conscious observation, and, and Wigner took, took it further. He said a machine can make a measurement, but until a human or conscious entity looks at the results in the machine, it's still in superposition. That's a tricky business, but, but that was the idea. Conscious observation causes collapse. And this is also known as the conscious observer effect or the Copenhagen interpretation after the Danish origin of Niels Bohr, its first proponent, uh, its major proponent. And he was happy to uh, avoid the problems. So we could go on and make measurements, uh, shut up and calculate was his famous uh, uh, idea. And, uh, and that led to great advances in quantum physics and all the technology we have today. Uh, TV, video monitors, electronics, it's all based on quantum mechanics. And you know, so they got a they got a jump start on that. Without worrying about the underlying reality. And that, that continues to go on. However, Erwin Schrodinger thought it was absurd and described a, a thought experiment to show how absurd this idea of conscious observation truly was. So his thought experiment was he tied the fate of a cat. So here's a cat inside a box with some poison. And outside is a quantum superposition. So it could be a photon or an electron or something going through a half silver, uh, a photon going through a half silver mirror. And because it's a quantum particle, it both goes through the mirror and it's a half silver mirror and, and, and is reflected. Now let's say if it's reflected, it triggers this beam which trips the hammer, which uh, breaks the vial of poison, which kills the cat. So if it enters, the cat's dead. If it goes this way, the cat's alive. Schrodinger said, okay, according to you guys, a conscious observation causes collapse of the wave function until somebody looks at the, uh, until, uh, so the cat is dead and alive until observed by a conscious entity. 
And only then can it be either dead, if here's our observer, so uh, he's, uh, in this case the cat is dead, or alive, in which case the cat's alive. Now, however, um, Bing. So Bing is, is out on the, the observer. However, this is dual. It puts consciousness outside of science. We don't really know what consciousness is. It's some weird thing that causes collapse. What is kind of, well, who knows, who cares? Let's, let's keep making TV sets and stuff like that. Um, it, did, it didn't solve the problem of consciousness, but it allowed quantum mechanics and quantum physics to, to proceed. Um, but if consciousness doesn't cause collapse, and I, and I agree, I don't think it does. I, I disagree with the idea that consciousness causes collapse. What does? What other ideas are there? <coughs> other solutions to the measure, pro or other interpretations of quantum mechanics? One is that there, maybe there is no collapse, and each possibility generates its own universe. This is known as the multiple worlds hypothesis. And uh, uh, this is very popular. In fact, uh, in a poll, polls of physicists, most, the, you know, the plurality goes to multiple worlds. Yet it's completely untestable, uh, and it's, it's kind of silly. It's a cop-out, really, because we can't figure out what happens to superposition, therefore there must be an infinite number of worlds. Can we ever prove it? No. Can we ever test it? No. Nonetheless, it's a, it's a popular position. There's also the Bohm approach of a pilot wave selecting states, but then you have to explain what the pilot wave is. Decoherence that, that a quantum system is eroded by its environment, but that doesn't work for various reasons um, um, because the environment is quantum also. And decoherence actually involves spreading or extension of quantum states. Or is there something else? Is there some objective threshold for collapse, quantum state reduction? These are known as objective reduction theories, OR. And there's, a, there's a bunch of them or several of them anyway. One is that if you get a certain number of particles in superposition, like 10 to the 12, that's too many and it collapses. But that's kind of ad hoc, it doesn't explain why. Um, what else could do it? Um, what, what objective uh, uh, threshold would cause superpositions to collapse and reduce? Uh, but first, to even, answer, to even address that question, uh, what is superposition? How can we explain how particles can be in multiple locations simultaneously? And this is where Roger came along with one of the ideas in, in The Emperor's New Mind, that one of the, one of the things that, that blew me away. And he, he relied on Einstein's general relativity. Now, Einstein had shown back in the early 20th century that uh, space-time was curved, or predicted, or proposed that space-time was curved. This is general relativity. Special relativity is something else. So uh, imagine there's a space-time manifold, or a, a space-time metric, or uh, geometry, whatever it is, and the idea is that for every mass, and these can be planets or suns or whatever, large masses, they're curved. There's curvature that, that corresponds to that mass. And then you could say, well, they're equivalent. The curvature is equivalent to mass. And this led to a prediction. This led to the idea that if there was, uh, here's our sun, if there was a star behind the sun and we were over here, or over here, uh, we couldn't see that star unless it, the starlight was curved around the sun. And Einstein predicted that, that this could be, could be shown. And sure enough, in a solar eclipse in 1919, Arthur Eddington photographed distant stars near the sun. He found their apparent positions were displaced in a manner consistent with Einstein's prediction. He proved Einstein's general relativity that space-time is curved. So it's not like mass is floating in a void, Mass is basically irregularities and, and configurations in a background metric or space-time geometry curvature. And uh, Einstein was quite pleased. Uh, here he is talking to Edison, Eddington. They both won Nobel Prizes, so they're having a good time. Good for them. <laughs> now, this was at large scales. Roger Penrose comes along and says, well, wait a second. What about matter and space-time curvature at small scales, like getting into the quantum. Why can't we extend this to the quantum realm? And so he, he invented these two-dimensional space-time sheets. Those, those curvatures before are kind of hard to figure out and so forth. He said, okay, let's take the three dimensions of space and make a one-dimension of space. And time is here. So we have a two-dimensional space-time sheet. So a particle here, this is going to be a tiny particle, is a curvature over here, and if it moves, or moves that way, it's a curvature over here. So the idea is that a, a particle oscillating between two positions
could be space-time curvature moving back and forth. And then, you know, the next step was, well, superposition then is merely both curvatures. And you have a separation in fundamental space-time geometry. So this was the basic idea, and it it's, it's also forms a quantum bit or a qubit, where you have a possibility here, a possibility here, and both possibilities. Now you might imagine if these continued, if these separations were to continue, you'd get multiple worlds. Each one would, would have its own universe. And you know, that's that that could be. But Roger proposed that these separations were unstable and will self-collapse, undergo objective reduction at a time t given by h over e sub g. h is Planck's constant, e sub t is the, the energy, gravitational sub-energy of pulling something apart, which can be calculated from its mass and so forth. And at this at that time t shown here, there would be a moment of conscious experience. So Roger had basically turned the Copenhagen interpretation around, the idea that consciousness causes collapse, and basically saying instead collapse by objective reduction causes consciousness. So when this threshold is met, bing, there's a moment of conscious experience, and that produces consciousness. You don't have to bring in some uh, uh, mysterious entity from the end. It's mysterious enough, but you don't have to bring in something else outside to cause it that you're excluding from your definition. Uh, when a space-time curvature reaches a threshold, it collapses to one or the other. That's the perception you have, that's the choice you made, and uh, the, that gives you a moment of conscious experience. Bang. So to distinguish that from the, the Copenhagen or, uh, interpretation of consciousness causes collapse, where uh, the conscious observer causes this one to cease and this one to continue, we have instead that you don't need the conscious observer and the separation goes on and at time t, bing, there's a moment of conscious experience. Now, these would be occurring randomly, kind of what we call decoherence, or people call decoherence, everywhere all the time. In the air, in the podium, in other parts of our body, of the brain, in everything. And they would be proto-conscious. So there's this proto-consciousness that are kind of uh, random and, and lacking in meaning and so forth. And this seems weird, but it's not as weird as panpsychism, which a lot of neuroscientists resort to to explain consciousness, because you can't explain it from computation. So they would be uh, proto-conscious and uh, uh, also like uh, Whitehead's simple occasions of experience. Alfred North Whitehead was a philosopher who said everything was a process and that there were occasions of experience occurring in a wider field of proto-conscious experience. So along those lines. But the proto-conscious uh, moments, I kind of metaphorically liken them to, if, if you go to the symphony and each uh, musician is tuning his or her uh, instrument at the beginning, and you hear these random notes, uh, and, you know, the, it's kind of a noise, it's a cacophony. So that's what's happening all around with these random uh, proto-conscious moments. What we need is for the orchestra to put it all together in a meaningful way. So the question then is, how could these proto-conscious random notes and sounds and noises be organized, orchestrated in the brain for full, rich, conscious experience? So, having read Roger's book, I realized that what he needed was a quantum computer in the brain which could biologically orchestrate quantum information processing, halt to terminate by Penrose objective reduction, connecting to space-time geometry, non-computable platonic values, because he said when the collapse occurs, it's not random, but it's influenced by Photonic values embedded in the fine scale structure of the universe, which has a lot of capacity for information, and also regulate neuronal and synaptic activities so that it could have influence in the brain. Well, I read this book, and at, having spent 20 years at, at that time uh, uh, studying microtubules, it was obvious to me, or at least I thought, hey, maybe it's microtubules. So I wrote to Roger and told him about the idea, and he liked the idea. We met in Oxford, and uh, uh, we, we, we became colleagues and friends and collaborators, and I been, invited him to the first uh, Science of Consciousness conference in 1994 in Tucson, after which we went to the uh, Grand Canyon. There's Roger, there's his wife Vanessa, that's me, about to fall in maybe. That's uh, philosopher David Chalmers. So that whole trip was, was quite, a, quite a trip, actually, because uh, Dave and Roger were arguing in the car the whole way about this and that, and Brian Josephson was there, and there were a bunch of other people. So, um, and, but in, in a hike across the Kaibab Plateau, we began to develop our, 
our theory. I think Roger might have been slightly delirious from lack of water, um, but um, but it got us started and we eventually developed it. So here we are uh, many years later after he gave an amazing talk at one of our conferences and he's being mobbed and I'm kind of acting like secret service to protect them. <laughs> the basic idea was that we wanted a quantum bit in a microtubule. So here's a microtubule, we have these tubulin proteins. So initially we thought, oh, they change shape and if it's a one or a zero due to quantum events inside. That, turns out the shape change was a problem because it, it, it requires energy and it generates heat. So we subsequently changed to a dipole oscillation uh, around the whole, wrapped around the whole microtubule. So two possibilities and a superposition of both. And to kind of make a long story short, it developed into a, a, a hierarchical theory of consciousness. So here's a pyramidal neuron, and if we went further to the left, we see, we see neural networks in the whole brain. But if we look inside, as we're going down in scale, we see one microtubule, then we see these tubulins with dipoles, and they're going back and forth, and this is where anesthesia works. And I'll talk briefly about anesthesia in a minute, because this is exactly where anesthesia works. And if we went further to the right, we get down to space-time geometry. So you can imagine uh, that these in information possibilities, yellow or blue, extend, might extend right into space-time geometry. And these would occur at different frequencies, very slow EEG ranges, going faster and faster as you go smaller and smaller and even further, uh, faster and smaller into the structure of the universe, space-time geometry. Now, there is actually evidence for this from the work of Anurban Dandipadye, who studied microtubule at, at three levels, the neurons, one microtubule here with eight nanoprobes, and then just the tubulins, and, and found uh, uh, electrical conductances at certain alternating frequencies uh, that give you, uh, that give you uh, this type of picture. And so, uh, and these, these are kind of self-similar triplets of triplets, he called them. So Anurban is, uh, is, is a good colleague of ours. He's in, uh, in, in Japan, working at the National Institute of Material Sciences. He's still very active in this field. Now, let me talk a little bit about anesthesia, because uh, everybody thought anesthesia acts at membranes, uh, membrane lipids or membrane proteins, but it turns out that they act on microtubules, and the work of uh, uh, at, at Penn, uh, at Rod Eckenhoff's lab at Penn has shown in the last 10 years that anesthesia seems to act on, on microtubules. Now what they do to microtubules is the question. So in this paper, my colleague Travis Craddock and, and others um, did a computer model. If you take one tubulin uh, and look at it, it has 86 of this, these aromatic amino acids, uh, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. And by the way, all psychoactive molecules, dopamine, serotonin, all the psychedelics are highly, uh, aerom they have these pi resonance groups, the, these uh, extra electrons, electron clouds. And uh, we, we simulated quantum dipole couplings among all 86 of these pi resonance clouds. And this was a supercomputer. I, I had nothing to do with it. I had the original idea, but uh, the other guys did, did the supercomputing modeling. And basically, we found it at ambient temperature. Everybody says, oh, the brain's too warm, wet, and noisy for quantum effects. Not true. At ambient uh, room temperature, or biological temperature, we found a spectrum of dipole oscillations with a common mode peak at 613 terahertz uh, uh, in the, in the uh, blue light region of the spectrum. And these are the anesthetics. We then added uh, various anesthetics and non-anesthetics, and we found that the anesthetic gases abolished, and, and non-anesthetic gases, which found in the same place, did not abolish abolished at 613 terahertz peak, which is in the blue light uh, region of the spectrum. Now, blue light deep in the brain uh, correlates with consciousness um, and usually stays internal to the system. It's not emitted. However, as we all know, uh, Hindu deities are often portrayed as blue. And uh, I asked Kaladri why that was so, and he kind of punted. A little bit. But uh, it could be that, that consciousness is actually uh, uh, coming from blue light in the microtubules, which is normally internal, but in certain circumstances can, can get out. Now, getting back to the ORCOR theory, um, the idea was that we got to build up a quantum superposition in, shown here in one microtubule, but there would be literally billions throughout the brain by entanglement and be, uh, relating to uh, space-time geometry, and we've reached this threshold for consciousness being. And because we have billions of these, we can have very complex, so rather than just the proto-conscious uh, moments that are random, 
these are quite literally orchestrated and organized so that we get full, rich, conscious experience. You can also think about a slightly different metaphor as the proto-conscious moments are like if you have a palette and they're individual colors and you take a dab of this, a dab of that, and you put it together into a masterpiece. Or you can think of it as the, as the sounds and noise of the orchestra warming up and then the band begins to play Brahms or Mozart or Beethoven or the Rolling Stones or whatever. And, and that's the difference between consciousness and proto-conscious moments. Orchestrate music versus noise. And actually, I have to say that I think after studying this for 40 years, that consciousness is more like music than it is like computation. I think the, the, the computer metaphor is, is severely lacking and is somewhat useful, but I don't think it's the answer. Another way to look at this is that uh, we have a sequence of events, of, of conscious moments, that can occur at, at specific frequencies. And, and uh, it appears continuous, much like if you watch a movie or a video that, uh, which is made of individual frames, it appears continuous, except there you need an observer. So I think we're having this, these sequences of discrete moments of conscious experience at various frequencies. And what the frequencies are is, is an interesting question. We initially thought they were like at 40 hertz, like gamma synchrony EEG. But now we think they're happening at like 10 million times a second, and we get interference beats among them that give us slower activity like, like EEG. And so again, it's, it's a, a multi-scale hierarchy with resonance and interference across many, many scales. Another, another uh, approach to the heart problem, which is why we have experience, would be that uh, if, why do we see red? Or why, why do we have the experience of red? The, the classical approach would be that in her brain, there's a particular pattern of activity that gives pain, okay? As shown in an MRI or something. In our view, it's a particular pattern in space-time geometry. Not just three of these curves, but many, many more. That's intrinsic to the rows and that is repeated in our brain. We, we recreate that same space-time geometry, perhaps by entanglement, in our brain. And that's, why, that's how and why we have uh, experience. So it, we can uh, attempt to solve the so-called uh, heart problem that way. Another feature of, of Roger's ideas were that the choices uh, selected, selected in, each, in each collapse, rather than being random as they are in other uh, quantum approaches, are actually influenced by platonic values embedded in space-time geometry. Now, he initially referred, uh, uh, was referring to mathematical truths, that, that mathematics is, is somehow embedded in the structure of reality. But in, in some of our papers, we extended it to aesthetic values and ethical values. Goodness, beauty, whatnot are actually, uh, occur, uh, we perceive them because we, our brains, our microtubules resonate with those uh, platonic values that are embedded in the structure of space-time geometry. And they can thus influence our activities. Uh, for example, uh, well, here's, here's one, one way. Uh, this is a cartoon I, I did for, for a paper where this guy is a uh, robot, uh, non-conscious, uh, sailing towards uh, A or B, but non-computable influence, which make him then conscious, uh, or is conscious, would, would make him sail towards C. So this is something changing the algorithmic approach, these non-computable in this case, it's the wind, but it's a metaphor for the non-computable influences uh, in uh, space-time geometry. So let's go back to our hierarchy here. And uh, as I, we extended it to the right into space-time geometry. And what if we go, and that's already pretty, pretty small pretty, and could be independent of biology. So it could go into the structure of space-time geometry, which is also hierarchical. And uh, I have to admit that I, I uh, stole this slide from Joshua's brother, Brian Green, uh, with, uh, advocating for string theory, but I, I think it serves, uh, regardless of strings, uh, something, something else. So as you go down and down and down in scale, eventually you get to the basement level of the universe, the Planck scale, where there's information. So it might appear smooth and continuous, but eventually you get to the, the, uh, the Planck scale and you have information. Well, if that's the case, con consciousness could also extend down that way. And we could be getting Bing as we go down in the, into the structure of space-time geometry, and which could be independent of biology. And uh, about, let's see, when was it? Uh, uh, 20 years ago, BBC did a show about near-death and out-of-body experiences after these studies were done in, 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 the, in, in Europe. And they had asked the, the, uh, the people who did this, this study, uh, Pim Lomola and uh, Peter Fennick, 
well, how do you explain uh, people floating above their bodies? Or claiming to float above their bodies? And they said, we don't know. Why don't you ask Penrose and Hameroff? Because they have this crazy idea that consciousness is in space-time geometry. Well, Roger had the good wisdom not to answer. Um, but I said, well, what the heck? It could be that when the blood stops flowing and the oxygen stops being delivered, the quantum information in the microtubules kind of dissipates to the, since it's happening in space-time geometry to begin with, it dissipates to the universe at large, but remains entangled so that you can have quite literally consciousness or a soul uh, free of the body, at least temporarily. And then if the, if the patient's resuscitated, it goes back in. If not, maybe it can stay uh, independent or maybe it can go into another embryo or zygote or a set of microtubules or whatever. But in any case, it can, it can in principle, account for uh, consciousness out of the body. I don't think that's impossible. And, and I know I, go, I get a lot of criticism from uh, mainstream scientists for saying this, but what I say back to them is, well, until you can explain consciousness in the brain, you cannot disprove it out of the brain. And, uh, and if it's a quantum effect in the brain, it can be a quantum effect out of the brain. And I'll stand by that. There's actually some evidence uh, in medicine from so-called uh, end-of-life brain activity from, uh, from patients wh from whom, uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, support is withdrawn, they're on ventilator, they're on drugs, and so forth. And uh, a guy named Lachmir Chawla at George Washington University started putting these simple EEG machines on patients as they died. And what happened was, and they have this, this number, 0 to 100, and uh, 80 to 100, you're, you're conscious. 40 to 60 is where you want your anesthetized patients. If you're down here, you have severe brain damage. And what they found was that at the time of death, as these, this dwindled to, to zero, they got this burst of activity that could last 90 seconds to, to, to many minutes of what looked like gamma synchrony EEG, which is the best uh, marker of, of consciousness that there is. And this continues to confound people, and uh, people don't want to do it anymore. In fact, they started doing the ICU, and they found that about half the patients had it. But the, the, the families of those who didn't have it were depressed because, you know, maybe their loved one didn't go to heaven or whatever. Um, I don't know. But it does happen uh, 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 at least 50% of the time in the ICU, or when patients die. Now, let's get back to space-time geometry. What, what is it that's actually curving? Well, we don't really know the answer to that. Roger uh, is probably the world's expert on that. And, uh, but this, this is a, an old story. He developed spin networks, twisters, quantum gravity, quantum geometry, and so forth. So all these things describe what, uh, uh, what the nothingness is made of. Because if you go down in scale, below atoms, and eventually get to the Planck scale, it's nothingness. But there's information there. There's some kind of, some kind of information, some something, some something. And it's one of these things, or maybe something else. But the point is that there is something, some information there. Now, just a couple things about scale. If we go, here's like the whole universe. This is like the, the, the size of the universe, and here's the Planck scale. And on a log scale, consciousness and biology is in the middle, more or less. So that multi-scale hierarchy I showed from the parent uh, would, go, would go about here. Which is interesting because it, it kind of gives opportunities for leverage. And, and we're, it's interesting that we're kind of in the middle between the, very, the tiniest and the largest. And uh, if we go back to this hierarchical uh, idea of space-time geometry, uh, it reminded me of uh, stuff that Kulabri was talking about when we were in college and afterwards about Krishna consciousness and uh, I found this somewhat hierarchical image of uh, Krishna consciousness uh, that has, as you can see, the cosmos in it. But in the background, you see this hierarchy. And I think that that's, that's the key point. And I think uh, reality, uh, the universe, is a hierarchical system. Consciousness can occur at various levels of it, go up and down. So let's ask another question. When did consciousness arise? So here's a uh, brief history of the universe, Big Bang. Uh, here we are, well, a few years ago. So we can ask the question, when did consciousness arise? And a lot of people would say fairly recently with tools and language. Uh, others would say uh, the origin of, of, uh, of animal cells, with eukaryotes. Others, when life began. And others, before the, before the Big Bang and before the universe. Actually, both Eastern philosophers and Western uh, philosophers uh, say this. Uh, West, uh, Colin McGinn, for example. Eastern philosophers uh, would, would say that. And so, but let's just hone in on one question. Which came first, consciousness or life? 
And Western science and philosophy would say that life preceded consciousness, which emerged from biological information processing. The brain's a computer, you get complicated enough information processing, consciousness happens. However, Eastern philosophy, panpsychism, quantum approaches such as ours, consciousness preceded life and has been here all along. So what is life? It's really another mystery. Um, you know, all this metabolism and stuff, it doesn't really explain what it is. Life on Earth apparently began in a primordial soup proposed in the 20s by Opera and Haldane, a simmering mix or a hot spring as proposed by Bruce Dahmer from which biomolecules emerged four to uh, um, billions of years ago. And in the, in the 1950s, Miller and Ure simulated this and found organic amphipathic biomolecules. So this means a non-polar uh, pi resonance kind of quantum molecule uh, end of it and then a polar tail. This is very much like dopamine. Dopamine is the pleasure molecule. And these, uh, these are found in the primordial soup. So I wrote a paper about this, imagining how uh, if this, these feelings, the, this, uh, that, that maybe there were feelings in the, in, the, in the primordial soup. So imagine that these molecules organized and they reached this threshold for OR, maybe you need many, many more of these, and they begin to have conscious moments and correlating with, with the same thing happening in space-time and geometry, and they form what Oppen called uh, myself's. So the question is, did primitive pleasure spark the origin of life? And uh, you get a bing, and uh, if you're a little molecule swimming around, and uh, something feels good, you want to do it again, right? You want to optimize it. And so I think, uh, now these primitive events would be random, proto-conscious, but some would be positive and feel good. So there's a bing with a little smiley face. <laughs> and uh, this would provide, this could have provided feedback fitness function for living systems to evolve. And uh, so that, that life evolved and organized to optimize pleasure and avoid displeasure. If these feelings were available by these molecules getting together, these dopamine-like molecules, maybe that's what prompted the origin of life. And uh, I, I wrote a, a chapter about this, The Quantum Origin of Life, How the Brain Evolved to Feel Good. And uh, I, it was somewhat of an attack on, on evolution, but not necessarily uh, Darwin. Darwin uh, uh, is, is a pillar of science, but the notion that life evolved behavior to promote gene survival, that, such as Richard Dawkins says, is an assumption which doesn't make sense. Why would an organism give a crap about promoting its genes if it doesn't involve feelings? Why would it care or do anything, really? It, it just didn't make sense to me. Behavior is driven by reward, pleasure avoiding pain. Every animal experiment, every rat in a maze, every, every experiment in a bio lab, the animals are seeking reward, seeking pleasure. Pleasure, in our sense, can include hedonism, you know, pleasure, but also altruism, uh, giving is better than uh, receiving spiritual pleasure and so forth. There were no genes in the primordial soup, so without something like this, how do we get from primordial soup to genes billions of years later? And most importantly, conscious, evolutionary theory ignores consciousness and feelings. So I raised the question in that paper, did feelings drive evolution? And uh, I'm still waiting for people to refute it or say why it's wrong. Uh, nobody's jumped on the bandwagon yet that I know of, but I still like the idea. And uh, I call it the quantum pleasure principle uh, after Freud's uh, beyond the pleasure principle. Now, to wrap up, let me just uh, say one more thing. Roger wrote another book a few years ago called The Cycles of Time, in which he, he said that the Big Bang was not the beginning. And that, that instead of the Big Bang, so here, here's the Big Bang, and the, the universe is expanded, runs out of heat or whatever. But then rather than that being the end, there's another one. And that was preceded by another one. And then through something called conformal rescaling, it, more, it looks more like, like this. A continuous eternal universe, um, uh, rather than having a beginning and an end, and with these crossover points. And he's actually, they've actually found evidence for this by looking in the cosmic microwave background, seeing concentric rings that appear to come from uh, big uh, black hole collisions in, in the previous eon. So it's, it's not a previous universe, it's one universe with, with multiple eons, and we see evidence from the previous eon. Well, if that's the case, was there consciousness in the previous eon? Well, who knows, but why not? I mean, uh, if the conditions were there. 
And that raises something, this will be my, my last point, uh, called the, the, uh, the finely tuned universe problem, or the anthropic principle. And this is the concept that values of fundamental physical constants, all these numbers, and, and I'll show you a couple, uh, uh, that there's about 20 of them, that the, the mass of the proton the, and the charge of this and, and this ratio and that ratio. And, and people have shown that if, if these 20 numbers weren't exactly what they are, if any of them deviated even slightly, we wouldn't have a universe habitable by life or consciousness. We wouldn't have stars, we wouldn't have life, we wouldn't have uh, consciousness. So the universe is perfectly tuned for consciousness, for life and consciousness. Now the anthropic principle encompasses explanations for the finely tuned universe. Now here's the dimensionless constants, uh, various, uh, various numbers that we don't really have to concern ourselves with. And there's two approaches, two major approaches to the anthropic principle. The weak anthropic principle by Brandon Carter suggests, it depends on the multiple world hypothesis. Remember that a significant number of worlds. Suggests we won the cosmic lottery. We exist in the one and only universe of an infinite number of parallel universes able to support consciousness. It's a selection biases. We are the only ones, or those of us living in this universe, all of us, we are the only ones able to ask the question. And there's a whole bunch of other universes out there where there's nobody conscious enough to ask the question. So it relies on the multiple universe idea, and there's one universe, <laughs> and there we are, smiley face, um, being conscious. I don't think that's right. There's another idea that was put forth by Beryl Tipler, the strong anthropic principle, which is more Religious, which suggests that life and consciousness play some intrinsic role in the nature of the universe by influencing those cons constants, which are somehow embedded in space-time geometry. How could that happen? Well, one way would be God. God comes along and, and, and sets the, all the, the physical con constants. Or, if you go to, to Roger's idea, uh, uh, could fundamental constants mutate and evolve with each eon transition? With every crossover from one eon to another, uh, is there? A, it's kind of like uh, evolution and, and mutation and evolution, and the constants evolve to optimize consciousness in the next eon. So um, consciousness would be optimizing uh, uh, these constants for for itself to promote consciousness, and therefore consciousness is is not only uh, driving evolution of life but also evolution of the universe. So let me close with some conclusions. And uh, basically what I want to say is that consciousness consists of self-organized rearrangements or ripples, you might say, in the fine scale structure of the universe. So if you go back to that slide where Bing is everywhere, that's kind of what it is, except instead of being just kind of painted on, it's, it's actually a process. It's like little ripples and self-organizing ripples, and that's going on in all of our minds, microtubules right now. These ripples, each a wave function collapse due to Penrose's objective reduction, are orchestrated, or go R, that's the theory he and I developed, and connected to the brain by quantum vibrations in microtubules, and connected to platonic values embedded in space-time geometry. And the consciousness may be guiding evolution of life and the eternal universe itself. Thank you. Just a couple of questions from the audience, if you'd like. Just raise your hand. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, so earlier when you were talking about the quantum mechanics, there's the superposition, and you um, connected that to... Um, can, I was wondering if you could also reiterate how um, the, I guess, the credibility behind superposition, and then with that, how, if that's relating to consciousness, you had the wave with like two little things, I guess, and then they separate, and that would be like an indication, or one theory was saying that that was an indication of consciousness. So, does that follow with the slides you were showing how you saw potentially consciousness could survive at least for some portion of time separate from a body? 
but then where would the energy be coming from for those two, I guess, things to continue separating to create that consciousness experience if it's leaving the body? So where's like the movement, the mechanics for that energy? Okay, we, you've asked several questions. So uh, one thing was I was trying to distinguish between consciousness as an outside entity causing collapse of the wave function. Instead, the superpositions are proposed to be separations in, in space-time geometry, curvature, and these separate, and that, that separation in, in the fabric of reality is unstable, and after a time, T will collapse to one or the other. And when that happens, that gives a moment of consciousness. Now, the other part of the question was, where does the energy come from when consciousness leaves the body and uh, there's plenty of energy in the universe at large. There's zero point energy, there's all kinds of energy. So that, that's not a problem. And uh, I mean, if you want it, you could ask that of the multiple worlds. Uh, there seems to be a, uh, a conservation of energy problem. So, but there's plenty of energy in, in the universe itself, even though it's, it's cold um, at, at the smallest scales. So I don't think that's, that's a problem. And, and these, you don't need a whole lot. We need energy for our, our physical bodies, but consciousness itself is probably a very low energy uh, process. And I always remember that in, in medicine because you know the patient may, you know, patients who are critically injured may look really bad, but uh, but their consciousness may still be there. And we're always surprised at how consciousness uh, can survive even uh, horrible things because it's low energy and can it can survive low energy situations. In the interest of time, we're just going to take one or two other questions. I've been informed that the Stewart's books are available in the bookstore. The bookstore closes promptly at nine. However, there will be books available as well tomorrow. I'm decided, did I see a hand here? Right here. Thank you very much. Um, listening to you, um, I have the impression that by consciousness you mean uh, a single entity or a single state or a single rearrangement. But we know that there are several different conscious states. We've got uh, uh, feelings, emotions, visual experience, and so on and so forth. So there's a big, big, huge diversity of mental states, of conscious states. So my question is that, how to account for that? And if you... Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, they're all, they're all uh, examples of consciousness. And as far as the brain, uh, when things are processed in the visual system from visual uh, inputs, you get visual experience. But what's, what's and, and auditory, the same thing. And emotions, maybe the limbic system, and so forth. So it depends on where in the brain. But in the end, I think they're all pretty much the same. And also, uh, the, our brains also, our minds, or our consciousness, uh, unifies uh, all, this, uh, all these disparate uh, uh, types of experience by binding, you know, the, the binding problem, neuroscience. So for example, if you see a visual object, you see something moving through the sky, uh, you, and it's, it's, it's shape, color, motion, and meaning are processed in different parts of visual cortex. Uh, shape, color, motion, meaning moving forward. And, and you don't see something red, you don't see a triangle, you see uh, a, a red kite, or you see an airplane, or you see a bird. And what's interesting is that not only are these processed in different areas, they're processed at different times. And yet, you see at one instant a red, uh, a red kite or a blue bird or an airplane or whatever. So that tells me that uh, these things are bound together by quantum entanglement. And there's actually some evidence for that. And, uh, and that extends everything. How do you, then you have to integrate and bring in uh, auditory uh, feelings and so forth. I mean, our one conscious moment can have all of these things bound together. So, but you're asking how are they different, and they're, they're processed different parts of the brain, but then I think they're all bound together through quantum entanglement, so we have a unified conscious experience of, of whatever it is. Would you please join me in thanking Professor Hammeroff for being here. ground running. Uh, management has asked me to uh, offer one uh, caveat here. If as a result of your attendance here in this program you achieve full self-realization as pure consciousness and become renowned as an enlightened being, 
The program organizers reserve the right to collect 10% royalty on sales of your biography and any film or television adaptations of your life story. Get a good night's sleep. We'll see you in the morning. Thank you.